celebration if you haven't gone already. Today I'm going to kick off a three-part sermon series that I'm going to do for the next three weeks called Church Around the Table. The thing about families is that they eat together. That is a picture of our dining room table at home. The chairs are not great, you know, when the cushioning goes and you actually feel like you're sitting on wood and that cushioning just doesn't give you any support. But we got this table from Alain's dad when he passed away. And the nice thing about this table is that it can open up and extend a little bit. So it goes from a six-seater to an eight-seater. But we sit just about every evening together as a family and we eat dinner together. And there is science behind the benefits of eating dinner around a table and not in front of a TV or in the car on the run. Science says that eating together can help prevent mental health disorders, it can help prevent adult weight struggles, it can help improve a child's self-esteem, and it can also help improve communication skills. This is our opportunity to connect with one another. And don't get me wrong, our family is not perfect, and there are days when our boys are not happy with the meal that has been made and the number of veggies that are on the table. Or maybe we've had a little bit of an argument because I haven't been that thrilled with the amount of effort they have put into their studying, and we have tension at the table. But my benefit is that I don't have little toddlers anymore. I've got a 13-year-old and a 15-year-old, and we are starting to have great conversations around the table. We use this opportunity to connect with one another. So church is also called to sit and enjoy meals and times around a table. When we look biblically, God has used meals and table in a very significant way, all the way back to the Passover meal and more recent into the communion meal or the Lord's Supper. So it is a very spiritual thing to do, to eat meals together and to sit around a table together. N.T. Wright said when Jesus himself wanted to explain to his disciples what his forthcoming death was all about, he didn't give them a theory, he gave them a meal. If you have your Bible here, would you turn to Luke chapter 22? And this is a passage that we know well. And this is a passage that we have read and spoken about many times in church. So today may not be a life-altering, life-changing sermon. It it is actually more of a practical sermon that we are going to work through together with regard to some of our practices as a local church. But it is the time of the Passover meal. And the Passover meal was all about remembering what God did in Egypt. Egypt. And the head of the family would always sit down and he would see and help the family remember the story of Exodus. And each person would respond at different times and they would eat. Now the head of the family would take the bread and he would say, this is the the bread that was eaten as we came out of the land of Egypt. And he would take a glass and he would say, this is the cup of freedom. But Jesus changes it this time. And instead of talking about the Passover, he talks about his body and his blood. So let's read together from Luke chapter 22, verse 14 to 20. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. And Jesus said, I've been very eager to eat the Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. When he, then he said, take this and share it amongst yourselves. For I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. And he took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an arrangement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Now, the phrase that we should all know very well is this phrase, do this in remembrance of me. My question to you today is, what is the this? Do what in remembrance of me? Is Jesus saying, take a little wafer biscuit and a little tot glass of grape juice every so often and do this in remembrance of me? Or is he maybe saying, do this 
the shared life around a table and meal together in remembrance of me. And I wanna throw it out there. I want you to be able to answer this question. What is the this that we are supposed to remember often when we gather together? Now, for many of us that are, have grown up maybe in modern church times, when we think of church, we think of a stage and a pulpit and a sermon and singing a whole bunch of songs. But the first generations of church were around a table. And I'm going to give you some history of that early church and how things have changed to church being this, sitting in rows, looking at a worship team, listening to a preacher speak. And today is around this practice of communion and the Lord's Supper. So as we look back to this early church, as I read in Acts chapter two, it said that all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. The ESV says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. This week, this week I read a book by N.T. Wright called The Meal Jesus Gave Us. And he talks about the six uses of the, the word communion or this practice that was done. Five of them come from the Bible. One of them comes from church history. So I wanna go through each one of those words. And some of you have grown up in different church backgrounds that have believed different things about this. One belief is that when you take communion, that this is the actual body of God. When Jesus said, this is my body, that part of the church in the world today believes that it is actually the body of Jesus and the wine is his blood. Others believe that it is more symbolic. So whatever background you've had, if you can just have an open heart and an open mind with me as we just go through some of the biblical terms that are used for this practice in local church. The first one is the breaking of bread. And this one is Luke's favorite name, which we find in Acts 2, which if I go back, was right there. And the apostles devoted themselves to the apostles, or they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread. Now, this bread, as you know, back in the day, they didn't have that nice serrated bread knife to cut the bread. When you broke bread together, you would take the bread and you would break a piece and you would pass it on. You can take a piece, let's break bread together. <laughs> this was pre-COVID where people weren't worried about what was on their hands and other people touching it. Don't finish it all, I still want it as my illustration, please. <laughs> Hey, bring it back, bring it back. <laughs> Unless you really love bread, you can come to me afterwards. But there was this breaking, this term breaking of bread. And it was symbolic of his body that was broken. And when we eat a meal together, I don't know if you ever think about this, that when, when I eat tonight, when I have dinner, that plant had to die or that animal had to die so that I could live, right? The symbolism of Jesus saying, this is my body that was broken, I had to die so that you could live spiritually, was a practice that was practiced early on in the Christian walk. And why did he choose bread and not another type of food? I think bread is available to the rich and the poor. It is a basic meal that most people have access to. So the first term that we find in scripture for this practice is the breaking of bread. The second one is communion. And this phrase comes from a Greek word called, called koinonia. This is a very interesting Greek word because you get very other names, other words from this one Greek word. And next week I'm going to talk about the word fellowship that comes from this word koinonia. But the word also means communion or shared life. This is a word that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 to 17 that says, when we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing or koinonia in the blood of Jesus? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, 
We will eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. This word communion has also evolved over time where we have put the word holy in front of it. Why did the, especially the Anglican church put the phrase holy in front of the word communion? What does holy mean? Special or set apart. This was not just sitting around a table eating a meal, but there was a moment where there was a sacred moment where we took the bread, we broke the bread, we passed it on, we took the cup, we drank of the cup. There was a sacred moment where we remembered. My life group that we've been running, my wife and I, for the last couple of years, we eat a meal together every Thursday night. Now, eating a meal together is nothing special. Most of the time, we talk nonsense over that time. Oh, sorry, eating a meal is very special. <laughs> and it is very special to do that with a life group, a community every week. But what I'm trying to get, a, get at is we can sit around a table and talk nonsense the entire time. If we were to add the breaking of bread into that meal, what am I doing in that moment? We are acknowledging the presence of God at that table. We are acknowledging and bringing the presence of Jesus being amongst us. We are not just breaking the bread, we are looking back to what Jesus did, his life, his death, his burial, his teachings. We are looking into ourselves, we are looking at our own lives, we are looking at one another, and then we are looking forward to the day that we have this eternal banquet with God in heaven one day. It changes the meal when I add a loaf of bread and a cup of wine or grape juice. I acknowledge God's presence and we remember together. The third phrase that is used is the Eucharist. And this is the Greek word for thank you, Eucharisto, which is the Thanksgiving meal. Where does this come from? Let's go back to this passage that I just read, and you will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. Then Jesus took the bread and gave thanks to God for it. So this communion, breaking of bread, has been, it's probably the most common term for communion, is Eucharisto, the Eucharist. It is the Thanksgiving meal that we participate together and we thank God for what Jesus has done. Then we have this phrase, the agape feast. The agape feast is a, a phrase that we find in Jude chapter 12. These people are blemishes at, the, at your love feast. So this meal is known as a love feast, an agape feast. Anyone think we should use the phrase for communion, the love feast? Doesn't that sound good? Actually, in the early church, that was the common phrase that was used. When you look at the Didache, the Didache, which was a manual for the early church that you can access online now, it's free. But it helps talk about the practices of the early church and what they did, and they called this the love feast. Philip Yancey says this about the love feast. This table is different. It isn't where sinners find Christ, but where sons and daughters celebrate being found. Maybe someday, instead of solemnly making your way to the tables up front in church, we should dance for joy. Maybe we should sing every born again song we know. Maybe we should tell of our homecoming stories and laugh like people who no longer fear death. Maybe we should ask if anyone wants seconds and hold up our little cups high to toast lost sinners found and dead brothers and sisters alive. Doesn't that change the picture of solemnly walking to the front in a somber mood and taking your wafer versus dancing to the front, celebrating sinners that are no longer destined to die, finding new life in Jesus. The love feast, the agape feast. And then we have this phrase, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's meal. Now you may not know this about the early church. They met on a Sunday evening for a meal. 
Sunday was a work day in Rome and many of the congregation would work on a Sunday and they would then come together and meet around a table and have a meal known as the Lord's Supper. Again, when I said, when you picture church, what do you picture? A preacher and five songs and an offering and notice and maybe a cup of tea afterwards. We all have our preferences. But the early church met and ate together. And I wanna say this about the early church. It wasn't perfect. So often we refer back to the Acts 2 church. They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and they devoted themselves to prayer and breaking of bread. But the apostle Paul in this passage I'm going to read for you now actually goes like, I'm not going to congratulate you on your behavior. Your behavior has been a mess. So maybe you are in a life group or a community group and you have some challenges. Guess what? They've had challenges right back to the beginning when the church on a Sunday night would come together around a meal. So 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17 to 24 says this, but in the following instructions, I cannot praise you for it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you meet together. I don't ever wanna hear that about us. More harm is done when you New Creation Family Church gather together on a Sunday morning. First, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet as a church, and to some extent, I believe it. But of course, there must be divisions among you so that you who, are God's appro- so that you who have God's approval will be recognized. When you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. So guys are coming along on a Sunday night to the Lord's Supper, And he says, some of you are not really interested in what we actually are all about. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. And as a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. The early church, some were drinking too much at the church service and getting drunk. That's a bit of a problem, right? Some of you are eating all the food And when the poor that have been maybe working longer hours arrive to eat, guess what? The food is all gone. And you haven't just eaten all the food, but you've had too much to drink. And that's a little bit rowdy. What, don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this, for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. This is a practice that we do today that goes back to the early believers celebrating it. It's quite an amazing thing to do. This is announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthingly, we all feel unworthy when we come to the table, right? but there is a manner of of doing it in a worthy manner that he's encouraging them to do. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthingly is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. This is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread and drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment on yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. This is an interesting passage to talk about. What does this actually mean? What did he mean by this? But this was a hectic time in the church life. Remember Ananias and Sapphira that came to the apostles that sold some land and they said, yeah, God, we sold our land and we give it to you. And what happened to them? They dropped dead at the moment because they lied to the Holy Spirit. They kept a whole bunch of it for themselves and they pretended. That was an interesting time in church life. But if we would examine ourselves, 
we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So my brothers and sisters, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, there's the word, the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. And if you're really hungry, eat at home so you won't bring judgment upon yourself. And when you meet together, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the instructions about the other matters when I arrive. This was actually a beautiful practice and a beautiful picture. This is where you go against the social economic norms when you have a banquet, the rich would eat separately to the poor and the slaves would, would eat separately to the masters. This was a radical tradition of the early church coming all together around a table. Slave and master sitting at the same table eating together. It was a beautiful picture of the body of Christ, how we are all sinners saved by grace. No one is at a different level or status. We are all sinners saved by grace. This is what it means to love one another. The verse that says, by this the world will know that you're my disciples by the way you love one another. New believers, guys struggling with sin, different races, social and economic standings, coming together and having the love feast, the agape feast, the Lord's Supper. So those were the five uses of this practice in the Bible. Then in, in church history, we have the word, the mass. And this is a time when Christianity reached Rome and the, the meal became regularly celebrated in the Latin language. And the Latin phrase, et amesta est, where we get the phrase mass from, means this, go, you are sent out. This is a lovely word or phrase. After you've had a meal together and you've broken bread, we say to each other, go, you are sent out. Isn't that a powerful thing to say when you close off church or close off life group? It's a Mr. S or whatever that phrase was. The mass, go, you are sent. This isn't the, the finish line. This is our team huddle where we come together and use it. So how did we get from, from this being a meal around a table to us in our church services having a tot of juice and a piece of dry wheat, what is it? Provita, it's not even bread. <laughs> Tough times. So he has a broad stroke of just a broad stroke of church history. We know the early church um, met around tables for this practice. Every um, scholar, theologian would confirm that they did church around the table. This was a meal. And it says that they met in homes and they also met in the temple. How many people got saved on the day of Pentecost? 3,000. We see that the early church in Jerusalem met in the temple, in the temple courts. They met in the temple courts and they also met in homes together. Then Christianity suffered persecution and the, the gospel spread and persecution pushed Christianity all the way out to different parts and areas. And then there was a defining moment in church life when Constantine, Emperor Constantine got saved. And he recognized Christianity as legal in, in 313. Christianity became a state religion. This was a pro and a con. This really did something to a, a movement called People of the Way that truly gave their lives. When they chose to follow Christ, they meant it because they could die for their belief. And what happens, church became a state religion and church moved into cathedrals. And then we find that in 364 AD, the council of Laodicea, Laodicea forbid the love feast in, church, in the church building. And then in 692 at the council of Trulon, it was banned altogether. And there are a whole number of reasons why this happened. One of them being it's easy to have a meal for about 20 people in a home. 
It's far more difficult to have a agape love feast when you've got hundreds or thousands of people in a church building. It moved from the meal around a table to a sacrament that was taken by priests up front, even done in a language that the people didn't understand. And the priest would often turn his back and he would take of the Lord's, of the elements and remember the sacrament without the people. And then we see the Reformation take place. And this is where the Protestants um, were fighting for the priesthood of all believers. And there was again a shift in church and there was a shift in how this practice was done. We went from a table to an altar and a priest, and then it moved further down the road to where we have had church change from it being a table to a altar to a priest, a um, pulpit, to the, the change that we've seen in church history where it's been about a stage and it's been about a worship team and it's become about a preacher, a superstar up front that people come and sit in rows to to listen to. And what has changed is that church, we are in a auditorium, which is a multi-purpose hall that is used for both our biggest ministry, the school, and a church meeting. It was never designed as a theater. Most churches that are being built today are built as though they are a theater. The ground is, has a gradual slope. You've got nice chairs. It's all for the nice acoustic sounds, and it's all about what? The worship team and the preacher. Please, brother, don't speak truth like that. <laughs> and this is the hard reality, is that when we think of church today, I believe in this. I believe in the local church meeting together in a church celebration. I believe God uses this in a powerful way and God's presence is amazing when the body gathers. And I love sitting under good teaching and I love worshiping with other believers. But if you think that is it, Jesus' picture of his body, then you are missing out a great big picture of what Jesus intended for his church. And preaching the sermon today is, feels like I am swimming against the stream. This is not an easy sermon series to do called Church Around the Table. Why? Because church is sitting in pews for an hour and a half, maybe twice a month. I believe in the rows. I believe God uses the pews but I also believe in the circle, the couches in a, in a dining room or a lounge, and I believe in the table. And I've called this church around the table because God has a plan for the table. God has a purpose for sitting around the table and eating a meal together and doing shared life together and breaking bread and doing this practice together around a table. Why is this hard for me? because it's very easy to come and, and sit in a church service for an hour and a half. It's really difficult. Hear me, hear me. It is really difficult to find people that you can do shared life with and get into each other's homes. But there is a great wealth in it. There is something so beautiful about shared life with other brothers and sisters in Christ. This practice went from a meal around the table where they took a moment and they broke bread and they remembered and it went to, we used these during COVID times, a little take of the top one, get that little wafer, try not spill it as you take the next level off. <clears throat> so what are we going to do, church, about this? Change. Oh, no one likes change. 
who resists change? We can't move away from the tot glass and the piece of bravita on a Sunday once a month. So guess what? We will still do the pravita and tot glass once a month. But I'm going to challenge you to take a step further. And I'm going to challenge you to have a meal at least once a month with other brothers and sisters in Christ and celebrate whatever you want to call it, the Eucharist, breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper, the agape feast, the mass, together at least once a month. And I know some of you are sitting going, oh no, Paul, don't. We are so busy. How are we going to do this? And these people are weird. And I, when I look left and right, a bunch of weirdos. <laughs> don't worry. I told you what that early church was like. Those guys were getting drunk at the Lord's feast. <laughs> they were eating all the food. There is room. We can make allowance for each other's faults and quirks and weirdness. But I'm here to challenge our current established life groups that once a month you have a meal together and you eat together. It's a very spiritual thing to do. And then I'm gonna challenge everyone else that may not be a part of a life group or a community. Host it at your house. Find a group of people that you can say, come and have a meal at our house. And don't just talk junk. Take a moment where you remember. Take a moment where you break bread and you take of a cup and whether you wanna use wine or grape juice, I leave that to you. But at least once a month, meet for a meal. I need you to be intentional about this. So we are coming up to December and I need you to assign someone in your life group and say, you are on communion duty next month, which means I want you to get the bread and the grape juice ready. And I want you to prepare something. And that could be reading a passage of scripture, one of the passages I've read. It might be leading a moment of silence or prayer. It might be sharing a testimony or leading a time of thanksgiving. I leave that to you. One of my frustrations, if I can be honest with you, is doing a series like this in November. Because most of you have already checked out and you are just waiting for December to come and you have your holiday and then we start again in January. So I get this. I might not hear of change in this area until the new year. I know you are stretched and you are tired and, and our family like this, we're busy writing exams and you're not gonna come over for a meal while we're busy writing exams right now, okay? But I want you to think about this as we go into the new year. I believe in the pews and the rows and I believe in the, the table and, and sitting around in a circle. I believe God uses both. And I wanna encourage us to take another step in this way. So Maury Claire shouts change. This is my change that I'm encouraging. And the reason why I say it is because I'm realistic that in January, I won't have all of you in a community of people fellowshipping in shared life together for some of you in this stage of life, all you can do is manage a Sunday morning hour and a half service. I thank you for being here. And I wanna trust that God is going to keep working in your life. But for some of the rest of you, I'm gonna encourage you to take a step deeper. And next week is part two, where I'm gonna talk about koinonia, but a different word for koinonia, which is not communion, but it is fellowship. And what does that look like? What is that? word and, and how is it relevant for us this week. So my sermon for next week is going to be titled Between Sundays. I believe in Sundays and I believe in all that can happen between Sundays. So this is not a feel good, let's all run forward for ministry moment, but this practice might change your life. You might find a community of people that you can do shared life with and it will change your life. It may not change your life up front here at church on Sunday morning today, but it will change if you can find a community of people that will love you and pray for you and encourage you and share your burdens with you and support you. And when a family member dies, they come and bring you meals and they're there for you. That will change your life. So I'm gonna push you and encourage you to push into that 
as much as I can without being legalistic and saying, to belong to this church, you have to, dot, dot, dot. Is that okay? Yes. Did you learn something today? Yes. 